Have you ever wondered why Revenant is so hellbent on killing, or why he killed Forge, or after literally killing an upcoming member of the Apex Games, was suddenly allowed to join in his place? Or perhaps you're curious about how, for many years, he believed he was still human, despite being able to dislocate his arms and climb up skyscrapers. It may not seem like it makes sense, but there's a very well developed backstory that explains everything. I'm about to piece together Revenant's entire backstory to help you understand his origins. We'll do his origin story in chronological order, but to make more sense we need to start at the scene in the season 4 opening trailer, and then we'll go back in time a little afterwards. It'll make sense once we get there, so just stick with me, grab a coffee, get something to eat, this is going to be a fun one. So it all starts in the year 2708, about 25 years before the current day. Revenant at this current time believed he was human, and had been contracted by the military syndicate to take out bounties in exchange for a whole lot of Apex coins. He was the syndicate's most valued hitman. The syndicate were basically a bunch of mercenaries that worked together to just try and get as much money as they can and profit from the frontier war. It was no surprise that Revenant was so valuable to the syndicate. He had been programmed to kill and kill over and over and show no mercy. So of course that would be a very valuable asset for the syndicate. This is when Revenant received the contract to kill Marcus Andrade. Marcus Andrade was your typical cunning thief, using cons and tricks with his wife to steal money and valuable objects from people. The client for the bounty had claimed he had stolen something worth 10 generations of his entire family, so the bounty was set pretty high. So Revenant takes this deal, and as he always had, he tracked down his target and killed mercilessly. Revenant even killed Marco's wife, showing just how ruthless he was. But something happened, a glass elevator shard cut into Revenant's neck, and in this moment his programming short-circuited. We're not sure why it hadn't short-circuited before, or why it did in this one instance, but there are some compelling pieces of information that help to share this story. So first, let's talk about why Revenant's programming hadn't failed up until this point. It's been made clear in the Apex lore that as simulacrums are brought back to life, their memories become damaged more and more. Later I'll explain just how long Revenant had been alive, but I think that could play a part in the malfunction. On top of this, whilst the programming for Revenant may have been very great, it may not have been perfect. It was still very experimental, and we only really heard about two other simulacrums in the Titanfall universe. Oh, and maybe Revenant just hadn't had a sharp object cut into him in that particular area of his body before, which may be a simpler explanation. So that explains why Revenant's programming may have failed at that moment, but why didn't other things mess up Revenant's programming. For example, Revenant could literally dislocate his arms, climb up buildings, and take bullets without flinching. Well, there's a very easy explanation. If you're a human, and you got shot, and nothing actually happened, you'd be shocked, of course. You'd assume that you were dreaming, or something not quite right was happening to you. You'd catch on immediately. But Revenant wasn't actually a human. He was just very intelligent AI. And AI is just programming, so it would be very easy for the programming just to ignore things that didn't make sense, like bullets hitting Revenant, or ignore him climbing up walls that no human could, or dislocating his arms in unnatural ways. There are thousands of possible ways a developer could trick programming into thinking a situation is is human, even when it really wasn't, and if there wasn't really a way to do that, the developer could just make the AI not even notice that situation happening. Regardless, Revenant's programming broke eventually, and thanks to five great loading screen pieces, we can get an idea of exactly what happened during this period. We know that the following five loading screen descriptions happened in the year 2708, so all of this was still when the Frontier War was going on, and 25 years before the Apex Games had even started. Started. This all also happened as soon as Revenant realised he wasn't human. I'll read them for you because it will help to paint a picture of Revenant's internal struggle at this time. Your first horrific thought is, where's my tongue? Never mind the piece of elevator stuck in your neck, or the fact that you're not in any pain. Why don't you have a tongue? And that's when you see it. A blip at first, like static in the air. A glitch. And within that glitch, a face. A new face. No, not new. It's the face that chases you in your nightmares. The face that leaves you twisted in sweat-soaked sheets. Except this isn't a nightmare, it's a mirror. And that's not your nightmare. 
it's your reflection. This is the moment the program breaks down, when you realize what you are, and the next thought you have sends a bolt of ice down your spine that will stay with you forever. Who gives a crap about not having a tongue when you no longer have a mouth? So the first loading screen reveals that whilst Revenant was clearly programmed to think he was a human, there had been problems with his programming. In his dreams, he would have nightmares where the real version of him would haunt him. Obviously, trying to make an AI believe it is human has its problems. Everything you know is a lie. The toothbrush on your sink, lie. The coffee on your nightstand, lie. The bacon in your fridge, lie. Is anything real? Yes, lots of things are real, like that time you drowned because nobody heard you banging against the ice or when that bomb went off and you learned what it felt like when your eyeballs melted in their sockets. Or the time you refused to beg for your life, even as the knife plunged into your chest and you heard the sound of your own skin tearing and the blade scraping against the bone inside you. Hitmen don't die peacefully in their sleep. Hundreds, thousands of these horrific deaths crash into you all at once. Someone must pay, must suffer. That's when you know your first stop. That's when you go to the syndicate. So this next loading screen is quite unsettling, but tells a really good story about Revenant's programming. So despite the option for Revenant not to feel any pain, the programmers still decided to program him to feel as human as possible, which meant every death that he had experienced, he really truly felt. The pain felt real. I mean, they didn't have to program Revenant like this, and it really is quite immoral, very immoral in fact, to create such a being. So it's very clear Revenant's creators are very evil. The loading screen also ends with Revenant talking about hunting down syndicate members to find more about what had happened to him to make him like this. Imagine finding out all of this information and suddenly realizing you'd spent so long of your life living this horrible twisted lie and an organization was responsible. Of course, Revenant would strike revenge. His name is Lowell and he's sniveling about his kids. You'd roll your eyes if you had eyes because now you understand. They're just bags of blood and tissue, goop, dressed in suits of skin, then nothing, like you were nothing. You dip a finger into the open wound on his leg and run a finger along a tendon, like a bow on a violin string. He screams that he'll tell you. You lean in, his tears sparkling from the glow of your eye sockets. It was the cleanest kill, he blubbers. Just enter the mark's name in the program. Day later, they're dead completely untraceable, the perfect crime. You break his nose on the eight on your hand plate, and Hammond, Lau whimpers that they made the parts. That's all. You decide to teach Lau a thing or two about parts, starting with delivering Lau's to his kids personally, before moving on to Hammond Robotics. So this third loading screen reveals that after hunting down syndicate members, Revenant found one that revealed that they just basically type in a person they want to kill into the program, and then Revenant simulates will kick in and he'll believe that he has a bounty to kill that person. It's like as simple as that. He also revealed that Hammond Robotics were responsible for making parts for Revenant's body, which explains why there is a big Hammond logo on Revenant's hand. So of course after this kill he goes to seek more information from Hammond. But at this point it should be clear that Revenant's starting to evolve his mindset a little. He's realizing who he really is and is starting to build a hatred for humanity. It's something he had longed to be, but he despises humanity so much for torturing him into living this endless life of constant killing and dying over and over again. You break the Hammond technician's spine on a bed of honeysuckle. He told you everything, how you're uploaded into a new shell upon death, memories wiped, lather, rinse, repeat, except hard drives are never really erased, and everyone knows, when you make a copy of a copy, quality breaks down. Blood trickles from the tech's mouth, you've been there, except you don't have blood. What was it then, that tasted like pennies when you took a right hook? You snicker, of course, your faceplate, it's copper plated. Ha, <laughs> now that's funny. You ask the tech how long it's been. He points to a bloody file nearby. You scan it. Earliest Revenant upload was 2420, 288 years ago. Your Dr. Frankensteins have been dead for over two centuries, a luxury you're not allowed. This is hell and you're eternal. You wake the tech up. You're about to take 288 years of pent up rage out on him. It's no fun if he isn't conscious. So this loading screen reveals more details about Revenant, but also that his oldest memory file was in 2420, 288 years before 2708, which is when he killed Marco and went on this killing spree on Syndicate and Hammond members. It's also the year that Revenant found out his true identity. We'll jump back to that year in a minute because it's important for Revenant's full story arc, but first let me read the final loading screen. Now there are no more lies and soon no more Hammond. 
You target one Hammond facility after another and the skin suits are too busy waging war to care. They blame the militia, write the dead off as casualties of war. It's not really a lie, it's someone's war, just not theirs. When you slit the last employee's throat, now what? Whatever your heart desires, I suppose. Except you don't have a heart, and all you desire is what you were programmed to do in the first place. Question, who gets to die next? Answer, anybody you want. This is the Outlands baby, there's no law, no order, and you're the boogeyman. Or at least, you will be, soon enough. So when somebody vanishes without a trace, that's you. When a murder goes unsolved, that's you. Your revenge isn't aimed at one person. It's aimed at every person. It's aimed at any person. An endless supply of skin suits and so much time to kill. What are you waiting for, little simulacrum? Get to work. So this loading screen really sets the pace for Revenant's current day personality. After finding his truth and realizing that he'll never be able to enact revenge on the person that brought him to life, he realized that he's just stuck in a life where he just cannot die. He's endless, but ultimately his programming still reigned supreme and his urge to kill was strong as ever. So that meant he had to just give in to his programming and go killing, even if there was no reason for it anymore. So just to note, this last loading screen was still in 2708, and the Apex games wouldn't open for another 25 years. So before we cover that jump, let's just take a reminder that Revenant had already been working for the Syndicate to hunt down and kill bounties for 288 years up until this point. Revenant was perhaps one of the Syndicate's biggest assets. So after losing him due to his broken programming, the Syndicate of course suffered a big loss. But it wasn't such a big deal because roughly 20 years later the war ended. We don't know the exact time frame here, but we know that in 2728 the Apex Games were opened. Now, one very important thing to realize here is that the Apex Games were hosted by the Syndicate, the very same organization that essentially owned and controlled Revenant. So we can assume that the Syndicate had built a lot of money from taking out contracts and doing different things in the war, and I think that they would have spent money on Revenant. They would have paid Hammond Robotics and the Ares Division to build Revenant for them with custom-made software to help them basically have a killing machine that could take out any bounty. It was a big, big financial investment, but obviously paid off. Revenant basically just killed people for 288 years whenever the Syndicate did it. All the Syndicate had to do is type in their program a name and Revenant would find them and kill them. You know, that's probably the best thing the Syndicate ever did in terms of financial investment in their entire war, so that's huge. Unfortunately for Revenant, that means his entire creation is just to kill. We don't really know if Revenant's human personality ever really existed. I think in the lore it suggests that the human Revenant was based on was already a hitman and then he died and they used that personality for Revenant Simulacrum, so that makes sense. Now if we jump back to the current time, whilst the Syndicate put their efforts into building the Apex games, we don't really know what happened to Revenant, but he must have been relatively quiet on the radar and didn't pose much of a threat to the Syndicate. After five years in the current time, which is 2733, the Apex games had become incredibly popular. It was a pop sensation, drawing in crowds and fans across the entire Outlands, and the Syndicate used its media power and the wealth it brought to essentially take control of the Outlands. Nobody could mess with the Syndicate, and if they did, they'd pay for it, as we learned with Crypto's story arc, as he lost his sister and went into hiding. However, later, Hammond Robotics joined with the Syndicate to announce a sponsorship. Now, we know there's some sinister stuff going on there, which I talked about before, but either way, seeing Hammond Robotics plaster their names on the Apex Games caught Revenant's attention. He suddenly had a new wave of rage towards Hammond Robotics. He essentially went through multiple Hammond Robotics offices and just killed employees, with no real reason behind the killing besides just having a thirst for vengeance. Later, Hammond Robotics had set to run a sponsored show with the Outlands TV to interview the latest legend to join the arena, Forge, who had been sponsored as well by Hammond Robotics. Of course, with Forge's affiliation with Hammond Robotics, Revenant saw that as an opportunity to kill again, because that's just what Revenant likes to do, blame his programming. Now at this point, it's clear that the Syndicate had a problem on their hands. They had just set a big sponsored deal with Hammond Robotics, and Revenant had gone AWOL again. The Syndicate could have tried to hunt down Revenant, kill him and stop him from being brought back to life. 
but they had a better idea. Instead, what if they encouraged Revenant to join the Apex Games? Overall, they knew Revenant's programming best. Revenant may have had a vengeance on Hammond Robotics, but deep down, the only thing that Revenant was really interested in was killing. That's how he was programmed. So we're not sure how Revenant was convinced to join the games, but a nice invitation from Revenant's previous employers that suggested Revenant could kill, kill, kill all day long was sure enough to take his interest. So the syndicate took that approach, which allowed them to ensure they still had a new legend to capture interest for the start of the new season. So that's Revenant's terribly sad story. Ultimately, he tried his hardest to fight against his programming and seek vengeance on his creators, but deep down, he never really broke free from his programming. He may have had 25 years of freedom, but it didn't take long before the Syndicate got their most valued killing machine back under their control. Thank you so much for watching. If you want more content, I am currently doing a sort of Apex training series in my members area, so it's just $2.99 a month to join, and I'll be adding new videos every week, and you can talk with me and ask me what videos or tips you want me to create and I'll make videos specially created for the members so yeah, definitely sign up for that.